Hey guys, this is a video response or a video follow-up on the stream I did a couple weeks ago with Shauner on Hard Magic. Uh, a couple of people, Nicholas and I think Yakrep and others, asked me to dive deeper into the actual mechanical implications of Hard Magic, because that's not really something we talked about. We kind of got sidetracked with also what is, you know, hard sci-fi and the like which is a tendency to happen when we're doing streams with multiple people, you know, too many uh, cats to wrangle. The easiest way I think to go about this topic is just by bringing up examples and then I'll go into how I plan on doing it with my own game. I have a playtest coming up for that in a month, and then after that goes well, I will hopefully have a reasonable document to actually upload and put out there. It's going to be a pay-what-you-want system, so I'll, you know, upload it, the working, unedited, yucky, imageless version of it <laughs> for anybody to download that they want. Uh, working title is The Commission. More on that later. The main game that people know Hard Magic from is probably Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, that's kind of a no-brainer. We talked a lot about what Vancey and Magic is. And the magic systems in Dungeons and Dragons actually represent that quite faithfully. It's just that they don't really explain it very well. And nobody ever role plays it. So what does that look like? Well, your magic has various components to it. Your somatic components, your, you know, moving. So it needs a hand gesture. Uh, because of that, wearing armor is prohibitive or very difficult at the very least. And that creates this image of a... Uh, of a Dungeons and Dragons wizard, of a, uh, people say a, a Tolkien-esque wizard, but no, really not. Not in the same way, anyways. Uh, you have to remember, Gandalf is regularly using a sword, riding on horseback and uh, traveling. And... Yeah, it, really it has no, but Tolkien's magic system is really quite light. He kind of explains some of how the magic works in the Silmarillion, but not really. I, pronunciation on that, by the way. Everybody pronounces those books differently that I've heard. I go with that one. <laughs> the verbal components, of course, you know, you say some magic words, and that one I, I don't blame people for not typically role-playing because... Making up magic gibberish can be as cringe as doing funny voices all the time. So, it's probably just fine to say you say some magic words. Or, I like what... Oh my gosh, what is his name? He is in our group. I will find him very quickly. Eli. Eli uses uh he'll he'll say you know some some few words in latin which i think works very well for you know the clerical religious spells and the like especially in you know your standard Dungeons and dragons uh galarian pathfinder worlds where uh, earth is a, a real place and it's somewhat feasible that latin has spread somehow through some magical means you know over thousands of years who knows but yeah in general there's that other component. Gameplay-wise, that means the wizards got to be able to speak for most of their spells. You know, if you punch them in the throat or, you know, just gag them or prevent them from breathing, obviously. Any way you can prevent them from speaking or speaking clearly, oftentimes if you deafen them, they'll have, like, in Pathfinder, they have, like, a 25% chance to miscast the spell if they're deaf because they can't tell what they're enunciating. Well, that's, you know, there's another mechanic that reinforces the hard magic there. As far as the ways that it's lighter, most versions of Dungeons & Dragons after 3rd edition, I believe, if not all of them, 
will also have a section that says something along the lines of magic works a little differently for every caster. So feel free to add details like lights, sound, the appearance of it. Pathfinder, I believe, has an explicit example of maybe your wizard casts magic missile and it draws upon some negative energies and so they take on the appearance of skulls as they fly out and seek their target. Nobody ever does that, of course. They just say, I cast magic missile. <laughs> the components pouch is another example of this and I think it's a really elegant solution to cutting the chaff from a hard magic in-world mechanic and not needing it to be a game mechanic, right? Something I really hate about modern video games is the unceasing desire of game developers to shove a survival mechanic into fucking everything. God, it is so annoying. <laughs> They just have to have a collect 20 bear asses. The, the thing that we derided World of Warcraft for for years is now just like popping up and everything, you know. It was bad enough that you were collecting so much junk in uh, Fallout 3 in New Vegas and now Fallout in, with 4 became a, a screw collecting simulator. <sighs> the spell component pouch helps prevent that. <laughs> Spell component pouch effectively just says, you know, off screen, you never watch, you know, uh, Kujula the Clever or any of other Jack Vance's other characters for 20 pages or whatever, you know, scraping back guano off of caves because they need, oh, I don't know, I don't remember what spell needs that or, you know, collecting eyelashes off of black cats and that's... It's just something that happens, right? The the wizard in the in the CD magic shop just has the stuff on the walls, and presumably your caster, who that's the thing that he does, knows that he's gonna need the stuff, and then you you only role play it if he loses that spell component pouch, and then ah oh, crap, now I I can't cast that. I need this, right? Uh, one of the reasons I really like the spell Grease in 3.5 Pathfinder is the spell component pouch, or the spell component for it is a stick of butter. <laughs> so it's something that you can really easily find, and it's something that's you know, uh, very... Um, you can cast the spell and not be have all of this big uh, ritual about it, you know. So somebody's passing the butter down the table. You know, oh, you grab that, and then, and then you make a guard slip, and that's how you start the fight. You know, when you're invited to some, uh, you're invited to some ball where you have to. You're not exactly on amicable terms with the people who invited you, but you're there under the guise of mere party goers. And of course you couldn't have brought weapons and stuff in and the spell component pouch, you know, maybe they maybe they thought about that and took that from you at the door, you know, oh just leave that here. Um but now you you have you have to think about things like that. Uh, I remember one game we were in a prison and the spell components that we could get access to were very limited because of that fact. And that became very interesting both to role play because we're we're talking to like a prison fence. It's like, hey, I need you to get me some some eye of newt. And it's like, dude, what the hell? One, no. Two, where do you think I'm gonna find that? <laughs> but it also makes you think, okay, uh I'm not gonna take the spells that are just the best possible thing normally because I can't cast them. It doesn't help me at all. I'm going to take whatever I can readily get uh, access to, you know, like uh, Create Pit, you know, the one that opens up the dimensional hole below people's feet. You have to have like a miniature shovel. So maybe if, you know, you're good at whittling, you're good at hand carving, you can pass that off as like, oh, I just like making figurines in my spare time. Sure. 
But otherwise, you know, you're going to have a hard time doing that. So hard magic systems should really impact the gameplay. But if you are going to have the gameplay mechanics be impacted by the in-world mechanics, you need to actually roleplay that stuff. And I very rarely actually see it roleplayed. Again, I just see, I cast Grease. I cast Magic Missile. I cast Fireball. I cast Haste. <laughs> Remember, there's all these different components. The magic words, the hand gesturing, the using of the material, the focusing on your uh, your magical uh, staff or wand or the, the symbol to your deity, what have you. Now, as far as my own system goes, I'm trying to cut a different angle at it where the way that the magic in the world works is understood, if not very well understood. So the most common form of magic takes the form of spirit binding. So this is based somewhat in real world occultism. Take that as you will, how real you think occult practices are from one place to the other. The implication of that is that you don't have full control over it. You can effectively only attempt to convince or coerce the spirit to uh, do a certain thing. And it's skill-based. You gain a, a greater or lesser skill at doing that. Much like in Dungeons & Dragons, you can have skill at knowledge of the arcane. Right? Maybe not the ability to cast certain spells, but the ability to know by these hand gestures and whatnot what spell the person is casting. Instead, that's how all of the magic works. It's all based off of a skill instead of a slot system like fancy and casting is. The primary implication behind this and how it works is that I will have a few examples of things of difficulty classes. Uh, it's a d6 pool system. So say at three hits of uh, fire spirit binding, here are a few things you can definitely do with that. And then at five hits, there's another few things that you can definitely do with that. So if you get three hits, you know, you probably can't do anything that's at five hits because you didn't get enough. Maybe you can do something between three and five, and that'll have a complication of some sort. Maybe you will have some other complication. And what's really interesting about this is that it entirely depends on how and when you decide to roll for things. If you choose to roll because you know you're going to invoke this fire spirit and try to get it to do something for you, see the result of the dice, and then have it act accordingly, you are less likely to have sort of uh, uh, malfunctions. Uh, malfunctions sounds more mechanical, more Vancean, but mishaps. Uh, wild spirits uh, playing tricks on you, you know, starting fires and play. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll you know, shoot a fireball at this guy and everywhere else for that matter. But you know, I will do your wish is my command. You can then temper your expectations and go, oh, well, wait, I, uh, I, I can tell the ritual is not going exactly as planned. So I will, uh, I, I won't ask for much. Or you could do it in the more traditional way and state what you're trying to accomplish, then roll, and then, oh, well, <laughs> if you're trying to accomplish something that needed five hits and you only got four, maybe a little, it, it happens, but there's a little mishap. If you needed five hits and you only got one, well, maybe it's a pretty massive disaster there. And... In this way, with the examples, you have, you take away some of the GM fiat by saying, which is my biggest issue with a lot of light magic systems and rules light mechanics that support those light magic systems, 
is that it's too much down to GM fiat. And the GM is constantly having to think, oh, is that too unfair? Would that make sense here? I just let this guy who got five hits do that with his role. This is a different skill and he got five hits. Would it make sense? And you're having to build the game as you play it rather than just role play it. In this way, you can still have some GM fiat and it can be very flexible and very interesting and not fall into the issue that the hard mechanics can sometimes have, which is after you play the game enough times, it feels like I've seen, the, you know, I've seen this animation before <laughs> kind of thing. And so I'm, I'm sort of trying to get the best of both worlds there, I guess is what I'm saying, right? You have some GM fiat with the yes, but I, I don't like that because it's, it's sort of a shorthand, right? A shortcut to what I would consider a good role play. But in principle, it's a good idea, right? The That happens. What you're trying to do, you accomplish. Don't say it like that. Right? Uh, but the fire then begins spreading to the rest of the forest. And now something interesting happens. Rather than the way that Vancean casting works is it's so predictable. It just always... But, pff, fire there you go it the fireball always happens and again you've hit that pendulum swing of well unless i insert gm fiat the fireball always does exactly what the wizard wants it to do because it's more technological in nature it's more uh, point and shoot than the sort of unpredictable nature of the real world occult as as you uh, may or may not have studied Study that at your own risk, by the way. Well, I'm starting to get rambly here, so hopefully that was of interest. Let me know if you want me to redefine anything, uh, go deeper into anything specifically. Just try not to let the video get too long in the tooth here. I don't have scripts for these things. Some of my friends suggested that I should write scripts for them, and they're probably correct with videos like these. <laughs> But I also know that a lot of people have mentioned that they appreciate how natural my videos feel. And thank you for that. I'm, I try not to be like many YouTubers that pop out the, hey guys, and they pretend to be super ecstatic all the time. So I hope my interest in these things comes off as genuine and not, you know, played up for views. I mean, hell. Oh, and thank you for a hundred of you. Uh, I think a hundred and one now, but uh, that's, you know, that's crazy. Because <laughs> I think the vast majority of you are real people, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, that's like, if I had a hundred people in here right now, this building would be very full. <laughs> so thanks. It may seem small, but it really isn't. Uh, let me know what videos you'd like to see next. See ya.